want that back? Uh, thank you very much, David. Uh, thank you all for being out here, and thank you to ICMU for organizing it and the long list of co-sponsors, and um, especially Abu Rashid, where Abu Rashid is uh, great food and uh, brings us all together for a good occasion. And I want to thank the uh, Presbyterian Church for letting us use this uh, setting and to acknowledge the extraordinary moral uh, courage and, uh, and, and honesty of the Presbyterian Church in addressing the issue of uh, uh, sanctions and divestment and, and the, the moral and theological basis uh, for pursuing justice uh, in a practical way uh, in the Palestinian issue. I think the, the Presbyterian Church is a leader uh, in this, uh, in the entire world, and I just want to acknowledge that and, and thank them for that. Uh, I want to share some thoughts with you tonight about the um, situation in our region in the Middle East, which really is defined by two major developments uh, happening simultaneously and connecting a whole range of other developments together in, in, a, in a moment which I believe uh, is really one of the most significant turning points in the modern history of the Middle East. Uh, since the creation of the modern Middle East by the British and the French and carving it up and creating all these countries and around World War I and beyond. We've had some um, historic moments, the period around World War I and the end of the Ottoman Empire, the birth of the uh, creation of the Arab countries, the, uh, the Arab-Israeli conflict, 47-48, the creation of Israel, the 67 war, um, the oil boom. We've had three or four major moments that were quite historic in many ways, but I think this is the most historic one, and, and it's hard sometimes to acknowledge or to recognize when you're passing through such a moment, but I think uh, one of the jobs of people like me who write uh, uh, journalistically and, and, and put their words out there in the public is perhaps to suggest uh, that one of the things we should do is step back from the day-to-day -day headlines and, and just step back a bit and look broadly around the region and say, what's going on here? And I think what's going on here um, is that we are uh, experiencing the most significant reconfiguration of power and identity and statehood and political and diplomatic relations since this region came out of World War I. And I'll explain that with a little bit more detail, but I think if you look at the two major developments, the Arab-Israeli conflict on the one hand and its repercussions, and the Arab awakening, the Arab citizen revolt, the Arab spring, the Arab intifadas, revolutions, all the different words that people use to express what's going on where millions and millions of Arabs in different countries are agitating in different ways for their fundamental uh, freedoms, uh, for the reconfiguration of autocratic political systems into democratic ones, for um, their basic human rights, uh, and for their fundamental humanity as human beings to live as citizens in their own countries. This is happening in different countries at the same time, motivated by a range of different reasons uh, and soliciting, uh, eliciting a range of different reactions from the different Arab governments. Three regimes have been uh, changed and overthrown. Uh, one leader uh, was killed in Libya. One leader is on trial in Egypt and a third leader is in exile and disgrace um, outside his country, and others are likely to follow. Um, the process uh, has been difficult for many people. Many people have died. Many have been injured and imprisoned, um, and this is the price that any country pays or any people pay uh, for their uh, quest for uh, a decent life, uh, citizenhood, and, and their basic humanity and human rights. But the, the magnitude of this uh, transformation that's going on is so huge uh, that it's sometimes difficult to see it uh, and understand immediately what this means. But I think if we see all these things together, we get a little bit uh, better idea of exactly the um, nature of the moment that we're passing through. And then that should give us some clues 
or some hints or suggestions about what we can do, but what we should do, how should we react to this as individual human beings, um, as people who are politically active in, in civic society and different forms of political activism, and what countries should do, what should the U.S. do, what should the Europeans, what should the Arab countries themselves, uh, Israel, uh, anybody else who's interested in this issue, what should they be doing about it? Because I think the critical uh, challenge to us uh, is not just to appreciate and, and acknowledge what's going on, but to take it to the next step of saying, well, how can we take advantage of this dynamism that's suddenly there and move towards a situation where all of us contribute uh, to a process of change that will bring us all the uh, the goals that we want to achieve, which is uh, statehood, dignity, uh, end of refugeehood for the Palestinians, uh, democracy throughout the Arab world, peace throughout the region for all the countries of the region, good relations among the Arabs and uh, the other people in the region, Turks, Israelis, Iranians, anybody else in the region, to have good relations based on equal rights and ending of the refugeehood of the Palestinians and their exile and disenfranchisement, and good relations with the U.S. and Europe and everybody else, and uh, perhaps an I idealistic uh, world, but uh, a world that certainly is within reach. Uh, and we should aim uh, very high, but to, to reach that uh, point, we need to actually figure out, well, what, what can we do to get there? Uh, then we should not be bystanders and observers of this process. We should be active participants in it and shapers of it. And let me just uh, mention to you the top 10 issues, and I'll go through them very quickly. I'll speak for a total of about half an hour, uh, so we'll have more time for discussion. But I think if we look at 10 key points that strike me as significant um, that uh, touch on these the two issues that I, I mentioned, I think the first one is that probably we're getting close to the end of the point where military action uh, can have any useful political uh, consequence in the Arab-Israeli conflict. The last several wars in Lebanon and, and Gaza between Israel and Hamas and Hezbollah. These were not wars between countries. These were wars between resistance movements and the Israeli army. And, and, and they were wars that, in which Israel was twice forced to accept a UN ceasefire against its will um, in a way that was never uh, forced on it in a serious way by, uh, in its wars with the, uh, with the Arab uh, armies. But uh, there's a new... Uh, form of uh, resistance out there now, and the Israelis are having uh, more trouble with it, but also they bring tremendous destructive power to bear on the Arab countries that they attack, and therefore um, we have reached a point, I believe, where there is not much more utility for either side in engaging in massive armed conflict, but only mass destruction uh, for both people, and I think there's a realization uh, on both sides that this may be, we may be approaching that point. And the, the prisoner exchange that happened a few days ago between Israel and, the, and Hamas was uh, perhaps one small sign of that. Um, the second point I'd like to make is that there are uh, many serious signs that the United States, by its own um, bias and in many cases incompetence, has, has almost fully marginalized itself as a diplomatic actor in the Middle East. It's very strange situation to have the United States, which is without doubt the strongest country in the world, militarily, economically, technologically, in almost any uh, way, it's the strongest country in the world, but it's the weakest country uh, in the Middle East. Uh, it has very little impact, very little influence. Most people in the Middle East neither uh, uh, fear nor admire, uh, neither uh, uh, fear nor respect the United States in terms of its political positions. They respect American culture, they respect American values, technology, they want to come here, they want to study here, do business, they, they want to enjoy the democracy and freedoms that the United States offers, but in the political realm, uh, the United States is a, is a marginalized, uh, weak, uh, uh, almost impotent actor, uh, due largely to the consequences of its own uh, policies. And this has huge implications, uh, because what's uh, happening uh, in parallel with that is that other countries are starting to uh, play a bigger role in the region. Um, the third, which I'll get to uh, in a minute, the third major thing is this Arab uh, citizen revolt, this series of rolling revolutions. The revolution is the word that the people use themselves who are involved in these 
uprisings. I asked the people in Tunisia and Libya and Syria and Egypt, what do you call yourselves? What are you doing? What is it you're involved in? And without exception, they say, we're, in, we're doing a thawra, we're doing a revolution, and we're thuwar, we're revolutionaries. It's the word they use that, to describe themselves. Um, and um, the, the consequence uh, of these revolutions or uprisings is to create uh, new configurations of power uh, and new mechanisms of governance on the basis of the uh, constitutional and citizenship rights of every man and woman in the, in the Arab countries that are doing this. This is an unprecedented uh, process. And if you break it down into component parts, uh, you can see several new things that are happening in this process, which will have enormous uh, consequences across the region uh, in, in the years ahead. And I would mention just a few of them. You're seeing the birth of citizens in Arab countries, real citizens who have rights, and who are empowered as citizens to actually get things done, to challenge their government, to make proposals, to get engaged in making public decisions, and, and to be part of public life. Citizens are now being born in the Arab countries in a way that never happened before. And you're getting, because you have citizens and groups of people who work together to try to change things and get things done and demand things from their government, you're seeing the birth of politics, uh, which has never happened before. Groups of citizens who engage each other, engage the government, engage the military in a give and take, and work together either in confrontation, peaceful political confrontation, or in consultation to come up with new policies. The birth of politics, there's an election in Tunisia this Saturday, there's an election in Egypt next week. We're seeing a, a very important um, signs of the birth of politics, and perhaps the single most important one, uh, I would say, is that you're starting to see in Egypt, clearly in, in Tunis and other places it will come, the military forces, the army, the police, the mukhabarat, the, in, the intelligence agencies, the, all the different security agencies, and there's many of them in the Arab world, forced to, to give and take with the citizens in the street, uh, in the media, in the political arenas. Citizens are making demands of these military rulers. Uh, and in Egypt, the military has ruled for 60 years, since 1952. 60 years they've been there in power. They're still there in power. But for the first time ever, they have to respond to the demands of their own citizens and make concessions and, res and respond to the demands of the citizens, the reasonable demands, and negotiate. This is an extraordinarily important historical uh, development. The, uh, the civilian oversight of the military is one of the absolutely crucial foundations of any stable democracy. And it's starting to happen. And you're starting to get more legitimate uh, government uh, mechanisms. Uh, the, 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 we're just in the early stages of the transitions. But with, this, with every election, uh, with every constitutional change that happens, you're getting legitimacy in government, which we've rarely had in many Arab countries. Uh, and ultimately, we're getting self-determination, citizens collectively as a citizenry who define themselves, define their government system, define their national values, uh, define their policies, uh, self-determinant countries. And the ultimate uh, uh, aim of all this is you end up with true sovereignty. You have countries in the Arab world that can really hold their head up high and say, we are not just independent, we are sovereign. We control our destiny, we make our own decisions, we do what is best for our people. We have real authority to act as independent, uh, dignified uh, countries that have real sovereignty. Arab sovereignty, like the Arab citizen, uh, has never really existed in a serious way in the modern Arab world, but I believe it will be the ultimate a goal and ultimate gain of this process of democratic uh, transformation. And the two key elements that we have to keep in mind across the board in every Arab country where there is a process of uh, resistance and rebellion and demonstrations and uh, whether it's peaceful or whether there's a violent response by the government and there's fighting, whatever it is, the two key things that are happening across the region in every country are uh, people are demanding that social justice be the foundation of the new social contract between the leaders and the led, that a, f a foundation of social justice in the economic development, political affairs, social affairs, diplomatic issues, foreign policy, technological transfer, education, labor relations, whatever it is, uh, 
social justice has to be the bedrock of the uh, reformulated Arab world. And the second thing that goes along with that is that constitutional reform uh, must be the mechanism that guarantees the rights of citizens and guarantees implementation mechanisms and accountability mechanisms to uh, make sure that the citizens actually enjoy those rights rather than just have them on paper, which is the case now. So social justice and constitutional reforms are two critical elements that you see all across the region. And I believe this, as this process unfolds, and it'll go on for some years, uh, that we will have uh, some historic uh, new developments uh, taking place uh, in our region. Uh, that will lead to other changes. You will see the fourth point, I'd say, is that you look at Egypt today. You can see, I mentioned this, the U.S. is marginalized. Other countries play different roles. You see popping up all over the region, Turkey, Iran, Saudi Arabia, Egypt, uh, Israel. They all have different roles now. They're all changing. Every one of these regional powers uh, is, is evolving uh, in, in different ways. Some are, will be winners some will be losers, uh, but you can see uh, if, uh, if you take the case of Egypt now, just in the last three, four months, the way that Egypt has uh, calibrated its relationships with Israel, with other Arab countries, with Iran, with the United States, in different uh, cases, different situations, but in every case, you have a much more confident, proud, self-assertive, and more, most importantly, sovereign and legitimate Egyptian state representing its people and trying to engage with other countries in a more rational and a more productive way, defined by what the Egyptian people and the Egyptian leadership, leadership feel is, is the, in their best interest. So they've opened up a little bit, uh, relieved the siege of Gaza. They've gone back to uh, mediating a Fatah-Hamas reconciliation. They just helped finalize the, the uh, prisoner exchange with Israel and, and Hamas and they're restoring normal ties with the, uh, with the Iranians, and they're being very um, careful with uh, allowing the United States to um, overwhelm them with too much aid and, and too many uh, orders. So this is an historic uh, development, and you're going to see this uh, happening uh, across the region, I believe, in other places um, when you get sovereign Arab countries that reassess their relationships and how they're uh, behaving. And as you get Arab countries that are more democratic and more sovereign, the foreign policy of the government will reflect the sentiments of the people more accurately. And this can only be uh, a good thing in the long run. And then you have number five, I would say, is the uh, important changing roles of, uh, of Iran uh, and uh, Turkey and uh, Saudi Arabia. In different ways, these countries are changing their uh, behavior in the region. Saudi Arabia is becoming much more self-assertive. We may like or not like what it's doing in Bahrain. I personally don't like it very much, but uh, the fact is that Saudi Arabia is uh, behaving uh, as a normal country and not as just a proxy of, of the United States or the Europeans or, or somebody else. Um, and just as Egypt is no longer acting like a proxy of, of Israeli or American officials, they're acting on the basis of what they believe is in their best interest. Saudis are becoming much more dynamic. The Turks are playing an important regional role, uh, standing up to the Israelis in some cases, but at the same time working with the Israelis, helping they were part of the mediation for the prisoner exchange, and they've been involved trying to help come up with peaceful resolutions of the, of the challenge of the Iranian nuclear issue. So a dynamic role, which before would have been played by the United States, but is not played by the United States anymore. So Turkey... Um, uh, Egypt, uh, Egypt, I mentioned, Saudi Arabia, and, and Iran. Iran's role is changing. Iran, I believe, will be one of the losers of the uh, current transformations as the Arab countries and Turkey play a much bigger role. The space for Iran to be involved in the Arab world will recede, and Iran will pull back to playing a role that guarantees and protects its own national interests, but has less intrusive um, policies uh, that take it uh, into the uh, into the Arab world. Uh, the uh, sixth point is that Israel is becoming much more isolated. And as we saw at the UN recently, Israel and the United States are becoming isolated in a corner together diplomatically. And uh, it's not a comfortable position for either of them. 
and it will force them in due course to reassess whether this is actually uh, in their long-term best interest or not. But the isolation of Israel um, is a very striking new development, and not just um, because of what happened at the UN, but this was happening before. If you look at Israel over the last 30 years, 30 years ago, Israel had very close relations at one point with Turkey and Iran under the Shah, and they had signed a peace agreement with Egypt. It had very close security relations with Iran, Turkey, and Egypt. 30 years ago, today, it has very tense relations uh, with Iran and Turkey and Egypt. Popular opinion with the government of Egypt, there's still a good security relationship because the government of Egypt wants to adhere to its obligations under the peace treaty as it should, because if you're asking to live in a democratic society with a state of law, and if you want to be treated uh, according to the state of law, you need to abide by the state of law. And if you've signed a peace treaty, then you need to abide. And the Egyptians want to abide by the peace treaty with Israel, uh, but they don't want Israel to overstep that and make uh, Egypt a henchman or a proxy or, a, uh, or an errand boy for uh, Israeli concerns. Uh, so e Egypt is standing up much more firmly to, uh, to Israel and to the point where a few weeks ago the Israelis actually apologized to Egypt for the five soldiers, the Egyptians, who were killed in Sinai. Uh, and this is unprecedented for Israel to apologize formally to an Arab country. So we're seeing this isolation of Egypt um, happening in a very dramatic way and uh, happening in a context that touches on all of its important uh, relationships uh, in the region. Um, this, the seventh point is that, uh, and this shifts me a little bit to the Arab-Israeli conflict, and as this fits in with these uh, regional developments and the, and the Arab uprisings, the seventh development is that we have been seeing for a few years attempts by various people, Arabs and others, to try to uh, reaffirm the importance of legal accountability of states uh, in, in the face of international law. In other words, if countries, if leaderships or countries or governments or armies commit crimes or are accused of committing crimes, that they need to be held accountable through some mechanism that is uh, seen to be internationally legitimate. You have the International Criminal Court, you have the UN Security Council, you have special tribunals that are set up like in Yugoslavia and Liberia and Lebanon. There's many different mechanisms that people uh, have used, uh, but this question of legal accountability for states is, uh, is the seventh important point that is starting to um, shape some of the activities in the, um, in the Middle East. And one of the reasons that the uh, Israelis and the United States reacted so vehemently, almost hysterically, to the Goldstone Report, and again to the UN move by the Palestinians uh, in September, uh, the hysterical overreaction of Israel and the United States was a very important sign that they don't want that kind of international um, accountability. Uh, they don't want uh, Israel or the United States to be subjected to the uh, demands of living according to the same rules that everybody else in the region is expected to live by. So it's okay to go and overthrow Saddam Hussein with your army. It's okay to take the leader of uh, Sudan and indict him in the international court. It's okay to set up a special tribunal to find the people who killed Hariri, which should be done anyway as a basic need of justice, uh, but to use it also as a means to hit... Syria and Hezbollah, which clearly uh, most people think is one of the aims of the tribunal, that they feel it's okay to do all these things, but it's not okay to demand that Americans be held accountable for what they've done in Iraq or Israelis to be held accountable for what they do in Lebanon or Gaza or Palestine. So uh, this double standard is a, is a very, very important, um, this attempt to break this double standard is an extremely important historical development, which is just starting uh, to take shape. And if you look back a few years and, and you look now at what's happening, Israeli officials are sometimes reluctant to fly to European countries because they are afraid of being indicted in European courts um, under uh, universal jurisdiction laws that exist in some countries. And 
So that's the seventh point, the beginning of a, a global movement to use international legal accountability um, across uh, the board. And, and if we're going to use that kind of uh, uh, accountability, uh, if we're honest with ourselves, we have to make sure that it applies to everybody. So if you have Arab criminals, Israeli criminals, Iranian criminals, um, any, any people who are accused of criminal acts must be held accountable to the same standard. Otherwise, we would be hypocrites. Uh, we, would be sub we would be accused uh, of the same double standards that we now accuse uh, often the United States or Great Britain or Israel or other uh, countries. So the whole point of democracy and human rights and the universal uh, legal accountability standards that we want is that they are universal, that they apply to all human beings. They're not selective. You can't uh, ask the Israelis to be sent to court, but not the Syrians or the uh, Sudanese or the Libyans or anybody, any government that's accused of, of mass killings and, um, and gross uh, uh, corruption and, and crimes against its own people. Number eight point is that the, uh, the move by Abu Mazen, uh, Mahmoud Abbas, to go to the UN uh, has proved to be an extremely uh, dramatic move uh, that sends uh, a message that the, um, that the Palestinians have essentially given up on American mediation. Uh, and this is profoundly important uh, because it represents two things. It represents a, a sign that the, one of the weakest political leaders in the whole world, Abu Mazen, it's hard to find a political leader with less legitimacy less accountability. He represents a few people in the central hills of Palestine. He doesn't represent very much more than that, of what, in the central hills of the West Bank. He has very little uh, support among Palestinians. He hasn't consulted with anybody outside his circle of friends. Uh, but despite all these criticisms, he was able to shake up the whole world and send the American and the Israeli and the European diplomatic establishments into almost a, a, an almost a hysterical uh, frenzy, trying to figure out how are they going to respond to this move, and all he did is go ask the UN to recognize the Palestinian state, which the UN, of course, had done in 1947, and the United States had voted for it back then, but still he, he caused great turmoil, uh, and that's one uh, sign, I think, of, of why this is important, that even a weak uh, political actor like Abu Mazen actually has power can actually get things done, that you're not powerless. You're never powerless if the instrument of your assertion is justice and the rule of law uh, in a context where justice and the rule of law actually count, which is the councils of the United Nations. Uh, and the second important message he sent is that the Palestinians, uh, along with many other people in the region, uh, no longer um, accept the United States as the sole mediator of this conflict. They've had 20 years to work on this. They've done virtually nothing. They've achieved no breakthroughs, and uh, that route uh, is finished. The ninth uh, point uh, is that the um, move to the UN uh, represents a, an important uh, new stage, building on the last two points I mentioned, of actually trying to find a new context of international legitimacy, of political activism, and of credible diplomacy, a new context in which the Palestinian issue can be put in front of the world for a peaceful resolution. And a peaceful resolution, as Abu Mazen and others say, that allows for an Israeli state and a 67 borders, a Palestinian state, and ending the refugeehood of the Palestinians through a UN, the principles of UN resolutions in a negotiated way with the Israelis, which is the basis of the Arab peace plan. So that move to, 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 to come up, to move into a new international context of conflict adjudication is extremely important, I feel, and it is linked to the, um, uh, the, the trend now, which is growing to look at Israel as the new South Africa, uh, to look at Israel as the country that is applying apartheid-like principles in the occupied territories, and in some cases against 
Palestinians who still live within 48 Israel or discriminated against, but mainly in the occupied territories with systems of power that are uh, in some cases worse than what uh, apartheid South Africa did. And this is where the importance of the boycott and divestment and sanctions movement uh, comes in. Um, and this is something that scares the daylights out of the Israelis because they not, they, not only do they not want to be held accountable to international legal uh, principles um, in the criminal court of the UN or other places, they certainly don't want to be seen as the new South Africa. And that gets me to the tenth point, which is uh, the tenth point in this enormous regional reconfiguration that's taking place, which is we're also starting to see the birth of uh, Palestinian uh, civic activism at the community level across the region. We saw it twice in May and June on Nakba Day and, and um, another day in June when you had the Palestinians uh, across the region on the borders of Israel marching peacefully and symbolically to the border. And one or two of them even crossed into, uh, across the border into 1948 Palestine, Israel today. Um, and this symbolic march, and of course the Israelis shot and killed uh, several dozen of them uh, in Lebanon and Syria. And uh, so this peaceful civic, civic disobedience, this uh, uh, nonviolent resistance by Palestinian ordinary people, and this wasn't organized by Abu Mazen or Hamas or anybody, this was organized by Palestinian groups. So you're starting to see uh, passive. Uh, uh, resistance, uh, peaceful resistance organized by Palestinian groups uh, at the grassroots across the region. And I'm, I would not be surprised if this were to turn into a worldwide movement where you'd have peaceful protests in front of Israeli embassies, in front of, uh, at, at every border uh, of Israel, uh, every place in the world where an Israeli official goes to speak, a crowd of people would stand outside and sing Palestinian love songs or or sing folk songs, or eat kubi, or, or, or do whatever they want to do as a peaceful uh, protest. Um, and the, the convergence between the uh, Arab-Israeli conflict now, in terms of where we are in movement towards trying to find a resolution uh, that is effective and in the context of international legality and legitimacy, uh, convergence of that with this extraordinary mass protest that is erupting across the Arab world by ordinary citizens uh, is that in both cases uh, people are asking A, for their rights as human beings, B, for their rights as citizens, and C, uh, to live in a situation where uh, they can enjoy the fruits of a system of social justice where power is subjected to ethical norms uh, and, 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 and principles of, of equality and, and fairness and uh, and justice uh, for all uh, within the context of the law, whether the law is UN resolutions or international refugee law or domestic law, whatever it is, the, the combination of uh, human rights and uh, legal uh, context to allow societies to function uh, efficiently and fairly and decently is the common driving force uh, not only across the Arab world now, but you see it uh, in the various uh, occupations in Wall Street and Salem and Portland and all these little tent encampments you see, and they've now spread all over the world, including into Israel itself. And I think we have to be very proud. Uh, and, and for the first time, I think, in my life, I feel this pride that uh, people all over the United States uh, who are involved in these uprisings, or when they did it in Madrid or in, in other places, and even in, in Tel Aviv, uh, they were holding up signs saying that we want to be like Tahrir Square. Uh, that uh, for the first time in my adult life, uh, the Arab world uh, uh, is, a, is a model uh, for civic uh, disobedience and civic activism uh, in quest uh, of human rights and uh, democratic values and, and social justice and the rule of law. And this is something that uh, we should be extremely uh, proud of and, and, and salute the people of uh, Tunis and uh, Tunisia and, and Egypt and Libya for, uh, for what they've done. Uh, I think this is a, a moment uh, that will go down in history uh, like uh, Rosa Parks was in 1953 in Montgomery, Alabama when she refused to move, that, move off the seat in her bus uh, 
and she wanted to stand up for her rights as a human being, or Lech Walesa in Poland when he started a strike by electricians and refused to give in to the dehumanization of the Soviet system. And ten years later, the whole Soviet empire uh, was toppled. Or Steve Biko or Nelson Mandela in South Africa who challenged apartheid and overthrew it peacefully. And uh, all these different movements were individual human beings and in our case, we have Khalid Saeed in Egypt and Mohamed Bouazizi in Tunisia who stood up and, and, and made an act of defiance, and they both ended up uh, dying uh, for what they did. Uh, but they sparked this extraordinary wave of uh, protest, uh, which has uh, now uh, been the uh, 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 inspiration for many people in the United States and in, in Europe and around the world. And, and this is a moment, uh, I think, that we should not only enjoy uh, and savor, but to assess it carefully and to understand uh, the underlying reasons for it. And the underlying reasons for it are that human beings, uh, whether they're Arabs or black Americans or Hispanics or uh, middle class Israelis or uh, students in, in Spain or whatever they may be, uh, human beings will refuse to perpetually acquiesce in their own dehumanization, subjugation, uh, marginalization and pauperization, that human beings ultimately will stand up uh, and demand th that their human rights uh, be fully affirmed and that their rights as citizens of a country uh, be fully uh, applied and uh, enjoyed. And they will do this peacefully uh, and they will keep doing it until they achieve uh, their aim. So we have now this amazing linkage between the sentiments and the actions of many ordinary Arabs and the sentiments of people in other parts of the world. So the consequence of all that, uh, I'll finish by saying that the consequence of all that is to make us think about what do we do next? What do we do about this um, amazing moment that we're passing through, which keeps changing? And we don't know in a week or in a month or three months where we're going to be. Uh, but we know that this force that has been unleashed in the Arab world and in many other parts of the world uh, is, is not going to go away um, until there is a certain fundamental basic satisfaction of the rights that people are fighting for. And I think it challenges us all to think about uh, how do we take advantage of that, how do we build on it, how do we uh, make it into something uh, permanent and useful and, and, and something that we can be really uh, proud of. Uh, so I think one of the first things... Uh, that we need to do is to just keep analyzing these issues uh, honestly, uh, openly, uh, and courageously, and not to be afraid of uh, uh, any uh, dimension uh, of this uh, situation, whether we're challenging uh, uh, um, accepted principles in this country or in the Arab world or in Israel or in anywhere, uh, is to keep analyzing and studying and really understanding uh, what is driving this process. There's a great uh, problem with the media in this country, as you know, the mass media in the United States tends to be very superficial, very distorted when reporting on issues in the Middle East. But this process that's going on now is an extraordinary um, opportunity uh, to finally connect with the global media because the, the quest for freedom and dignity and democracy uh, is a universal one. Uh, and it's a language that every uh, person in the world uh, can understand. The second thing I think that uh, we have to do is to uh, emphasize over and over and over again uh, that the, the resolution of the Arab-Israeli conflict uh, peacefully, uh, legally, and equitably for all concerned has to be the number one priority of diplomatic action uh, in the region. Uh, before uh, Iran, before terrorism, before uh, mass destruction weapons, before anything else that people want to come up with, before oil, Resolving the Arab-Israeli conflict, which is the oldest and most destabilizing and radicalizing conflict in the region, resolving it peacefully and fairly will be the single biggest contribution to achieving all the goals that everybody wants to achieve in the Arab world, in Israel, in Turkey, in Iran, in the United States, Europe. Everybody will benefit from an equitable resolution uh, of the Arab-Israeli conflict. And the third thing I think that we have to do, all of us in our different ways, and people can do this from their home, on the internet, sending letters, on the telephone, talking to your children, talking to your neighbors, going to your school. Everybody can, can be an activist now. Uh, one of the things that has happened is not just the birth of the Arab citizen in the Arab world. Formerly helpless people have power in the Arab world. The average citizen can get things done now. 
but so can you and so can I and so can all of us uh, use the power. And what is that power? It is simply the, the affirmation uh, that justice will be done, that our citizenship will be activated, that our rights will be enjoyed, that we will not acquiesce forever in our own dehumanization, that we will work together peacefully, honestly, openly to achieve the rights that are ours by the fact that we are citizens of fine countries and that we are children of a single God. Thank you very much. You've been listening to journalist, scholar, and newspaper editor Rami G. Khoury speaking at the Westminster Presbyterian Church in Portland, Oregon. The title of his lecture is Diplomatic Stalemate and Democratic Revolts, Making Sense of a Middle East Transition. In a moment, we'll return to the question and answer session from the presentation. Rami Khoury is a Palestinian, Jordanian, and U.S. citizen whose family lives in Beirut, Amman, and Nazareth. He is the director of the Issam Fares Institute of Public Policy and International Affairs at the American University in Beirut, Lebanon, and editor-at-large of the Daily Star newspaper, also based in that city. To find out more about Rami Khoury and his work, please visit his website, at ramikhouri.com. That's R-A-M-I-K-H-O-U-R-I dot com. This program was sponsored by the Institute for Christian Muslim Understanding. To find out more about that organization, please visit their website at icmuoregon.org. In addition, This presentation was co-sponsored and endorsed by many other local organizations. A complete list is included in the closing credits. And now we return to the question and answer session from the presentation. Rami Khoury spoke at the Westminster Presbyterian Church in Portland, Oregon on October 20, 2011. Okay. Your view on the possibility of Islamist parties coming to power in either Tunisia, Egypt, or Libya, what impact would it have on the democratic process in these countries and in their future relations with the West and Israel? I think um, Islamist parties, broadly speaking, and we're talking of Muslim brothers and the mainstream parties, we're not talking of Qaeda and the terrorist groups, but the mainstream Islamist parties across the region, If they play by the democratic rules, which I believe they all agree to play by now, and you see this in Nahda in Tunisia on Saturday, and their their participation in the election, the Muslim brothers in Egypt, uh, you'll see this, you're seeing it all over the region. Uh, I think we have to treat them like any other political party. And I think we have to uh, recognize that as they get into these elections that are actually fair and real elections, Um, two things will happen. A, they will be subjected to incredibly wide, real competition from other political groupings in a way that they've never experienced before. Before it was just, you know, uh, Zain al-Abidin bin Ali versus uh, uh, Hanoushi in uh, Tunis. Uh, The Muslim Brothers versus Hosni Mubarak. There was no real competition uh, and in this, and in a, con- in a context that was controlled completely by these autocratic dictatorial regimes, the second thing that will happen is they'll be subjected to the accountability of their own constituents and citizens. This is a very, very significant step, and and we know from the Turkish experience and others that once these Islamist groups are subjected to real accountability, if they're in power, they've got to perform, they've got to deliver to what their citizens want, and what their citizens want. Uh, is not radical Islam or uh, uh, faith-driven uh, societies. They, they want faith, they want their Islamic faith and their Christian faith to permeate how people behave, uh, that the principles of their Islamic faith and their Christian faith, but in this case, Islamist parties, they want pr- those principles to... Uh, help uh, color how society functions, but they don't want religious people running their societies. We know this from polling and from a lot of other evidence. So I have, I'm not worried at all about 
Islamist parties because they'll be subjected to real competition and real accountability and they will very quickly do, if they succeed, uh, then uh, they will probably follow the same course as the uh, Justice and Development Party in Turkey, which increasing, increasingly became pragmatic and more efficient at delivering what their constituents want. And Turkey today is a very impressive model of, uh, of not only a good democracy but a thriving uh, economy which is increasingly secular, uh, but if you go to a presidential cocktail party in Turkey, you drink Pepsi Cola and orange juice. You don't drink alcohol. And, and that's, that's, in my view, that's a perfectly fair trade-off. If that's what the society wants, uh, if the price of uh, good government and uh, a largely secular public uh, uh, system is small symbolic gestures to the Islamic faith, and these are Islamic majority countries, then I think we should welcome that. That shouldn't be a problem. What are a few key resources for understanding the post-World War I history of the Middle East? Well, there's a lot of uh, good books and uh, uh, websites uh, around. And uh, I t the first uh, thing, if anybody wants to understand the post-World War I, World War I history, is you have to understand the World War I history, which was uh, the creation of the modern Middle East. And there's a book by a fellow called David Fromkin, F-R-O-M-K-I-N, David Fromkin, called The Peace to End All Peace. It's an extraordinary book about what happened between 1914 and 1920 and the, the British duplicity and the French duplicity in creating uh, the Sykes-Picot and then this carving up the Middle East. That book is the single most useful background reading to understand all the troubles that have uh, uh, happened uh, since then. Uh, given that Israel keeps expanding its settlement in the West Bank, do you, th do you think that a Palestinian state is a vile option and what uh, the Palestinians should do in case your answer is negative? I think it's still possible to have a two-state solution. It's more difficult every year with the settlements. Uh, but you can build a settlement and you can vacate a settlement. And uh, the Israelis have twice vacated settlements in, uh, in the Sinai when the peace with Egypt and then when they got out of uh, Gaza. Um, those were not as strategically important for them, perhaps, or, or, or emotionally or religiously important for some of the religious zealots in Israel. Uh, but, uh, but I believe that the settlements... Uh, the major settlement blocks that are near the border uh, will be incorporated into Israel in return for land of equal value. So I think that's already pretty much agreed. And a lot of the settlements inside the West Bank will have to be vacated. Unless part of the peace agreement is that, um, that uh, Israelis can live in Palestinian, under Palestinian sovereignty with the permission of the Palestinians. They, they get a residence permit and they're allowed to live there, but they don't own that. They don't live there as predators, as colonial settlers. They live there as guests in a foreign country. Like I live in, in Lebanon as a guest. I get a work permit and a residence permit from the Lebanese authorities, and I own my house, and I can live there as a good resident, uh, but I'm not, uh, I didn't take any land away from any Lebanese. That's possible that there might be some agreements on some settlements in return for um, uh, equal rights for Palestinians to go and live in Israel uh, if they want. So I, it's more and more difficult to get a two-state solution because um, of the uh, nature of the, uh, um, the way that the extreme right-wing parties have a stranglehold on the Israeli coalition government. So that's a problem within, uh, within Israel. The one-state solution that many people talk about uh, is an ideal option, I think, to have one state with uh, Christians, Muslims, and Jews, Arabs, and Israelis, uh, but I don't think it's realistic in the short run. We should keep pushing for it as a long-term uh, goal, um, we sh the, but it's not a, at all possible in the short run simply because the Israelis will never accept it. They want a, a state that has a majority of Jews, which is what they have now. Uh, but what the Israelis want is not, doesn't mean that's what's going to happen. This is what they want. They're strong now, and they can keep the situation. But the situation, as I explained, is they're increasingly isolated. They're increasingly turned into an apartheid, uh, isolated uh, pariah regime in the world. And the more pressure that's built on them, the more uh, difficulty they'll have. So uh, the Israelis will change their position. They have changed some positions. They've just negotiated a deal with Hamas, which they've always said they don't want to do, but they've done it. They've negotiated several ceasefires with Hamas. So I wouldn't be surprised if we start seeing some 
changes within Israel in terms of how to deal with the Palestinians. And if we get a reconstituted Hamas Fatah national unity government with other Palestinians involved and, and the refugees having a say, I think this would provide a very important platform for a re, uh, renegotiations with uh, Israel on a different, uh, on a different platform uh, with much more legitimacy among the Palestinians. U.S. Congress is starting to cut humanitarian development aid to Palestine to punish them for their U.N. statehood bid. Will this further weaken the U.S. position? Will Arab and other countries help the Palestinians with this funding? My guess is the U.S. will not cut off large-scale funding. Uh, I think they will make symbolic actions. Uh, they have to do something to appease the pro-Israeli forces in Congress, which are very big. But I think uh, they will realize that this is really a, an emotional overreaction. Um, I think that the um, effort that is being made now behind the scenes in the UN and, and Europe around the world to try to find a formula at the UN that would be possibly satisfactory for everybody may lead to a situation where the Palestinians get from the UN what they want uh, in return for uh, certain measures that would not have the U.S. cut off all its aid. But if the U.S. were to cut off all its aid, then that, so be it. The United States is not the guardian of the Middle East. And this would be the final uh, uh, nail in the coffin of U.S. credibility and influence in the Middle East. This would be a catastrophe for the U.S. I think they will realize this. The, the few sober heads in Washington would realize that this is really not good for the United States. And I think my guess is that they will reassess this very carefully and try to come up with some compromise face-saving uh, measures. But if the U.S. were to cut off all its aid and if it were to leave UNESCO as it's starting to do, I think the world would say, you know, goodbye, Allah makum. Uh, if you want to go, go. Um, and, and, and this is something that we should be prepared for. And uh, I think other people uh, will step in and, uh, and it'll probably cause the Israelis to reconsider uh, how they deal with the occupation. You mentioned the isolation of Israel and American foreign diplomacy with the continuation of American support to Israel's militarily and the Americans' veto of the Palestinian state at the UN. How do you see the reaction of the Arab uh, street to that? I think the uh, reaction of the Arab uh, uh, street or Arab public opinion will be uh, rather low-key because I think we've already made our reaction um, in the various symbols by which Palestinians and other Arabs have made it clear to the United States uh, that we're not waiting for you anymore to come and solve our problem. Uh, Abu Mazen's move at the UN, Salam Fayyad's move to um, uh, try to set up the infrastructure for a Palestinian state sometime uh, soon, the Palestinians who have been marching around to the symbolically coming to the borders of Israel, the Saudis uh, warning the United States uh, several times, the Turks stepping in to play a mediating role where the U.S. used to do it. There's been quite a few signs of the fact that people in the Arab world no longer are waiting for the United States. So if the U.S. were to make the veto, I don't think it would have a huge uh, impact uh, because we've already more or less written off the United States for the moment, which is not a good thing. I think you want the United States involved in this process, but it, if it's going to be involved, it has to be involved uh, on a credible basis, uh, in the same way that it was involved, say, with the mediation in Northern Ireland, where it was a very good mediator and led to a, a peace agreement. So I don't, I don't think we should be happy that the U.S. is isolated and out of the picture necessarily. Uh, it's better to have the U.S. involved as a fair mediator, an equal-handed mediator. That's what we want uh, to try to uh, aspire. Do you see any political changes in Saudi Arabia? I see very small incremental signs uh, that uh, one uh, very old king in Saudi Arabia understands the need to uh, make reform steps slowly and steadily. I don't see major signs that the power structure in Saudi Arabia is going to undertake any major constitutional changes. Saudi Arabia will be the last country in the Arab world to undertake major political reform. Um, it's a very uh, unusual combination of a strict Wahhabi religious doctrine allied with a very um, militant uh, uh, royal uh, 
family, uh, the Saudi family, the Sa- House of Saud. They've done this now for a couple, 300 years or so. And uh, this, and with enormous wealth uh, that they have, uh, so they don't feel the need to make significant changes. Uh, and I think the evolution of the political structures or the social systems in Saudi Arabia will come at a much slower pace, and it'll be driven mainly by uh, the ed- education of women, which is continuing at a very high uh, pace, and mainly by continued interaction between Saudi Arabia and the rest of the world. And I think we just have to live with that. It's, just to, it, it, it's not up to any one of us to tell anyone else how to run their house. Uh, the only thing we can demand of the Saudis is that they don't uh, attack their neighbors or they don't flagrantly uh, get involved in uh, mass denial of human rights uh, like uh, yeah, killing people or slavery or stuff, things of that nature. Uh, the issue of uh, the role of women, the issue of political uh, civil liberties are issues that are primarily uh, their uh, uh, concern, and they have to take the lead. And it's hard sometimes to look at a country and see some behavior like women are not allowed to drive or women cannot vote. Uh, I personally think that's wrong, that women should be allowed to drive and vote. Uh, but it's not my issue. I can't tell them how to run their country. Uh, so it's a very difficult question. Um, how do you deal with other countries? When you look at people in the U.S. all the time say, we have to do something about Afghanistan because the Taliban are going to prevent these women from going to school. And I tell them, absolutely, you have to speak out about it. You have to um, uh, encourage the Taliban to let the women go to school. But in the final analysis, the United States is neither morally nor legally or politically mandated to care for the women of Afghanistan. Neither am I mandated to care for the women of China or the young men and, or the children of Argentina. It's not our responsibility to do this. It's our responsibility to speak out. If we see a crime, if we see human rights denials, if we see mass suffering, absolutely we should speak out. And if we're governments, we can make uh, symbolic gestures. But this is one of the most difficult um, issues. And I think if the best example, the best thing if anybody wants to do something about uh, say, the political situation in Saudi Arabia, whether it's the civil rights of all Saudis or the status of women or the status of foreign workers or anything like that, make your country the best example of how to deal with women and workers and children and youth and, and, and foreigners and minorities. Make your country a model. And the Saudis and the Kuwaitis and the Arabs and the Chinese and the Taliban and everybody else will, uh, will follow us. What is happening to Christians in the Arab world, especially those in Egypt, Syria, and Palestine? Are they being suppressed, marginalized, ousted? Christians for the last 30, 40 years uh, have been uh, squeezed uh, demographically in the Arab, in most of the Arab countries, uh, part for many different reasons, uh, economic uh, conditions, uh, some people not being comfortable with the Islamic wave all around them, some people under conditions of warfare in Iraq and Lebanon and Palestine, uh, under conditions of occupation, um, for, and then for, for reasons that are relevant to any minority group, they tend to be better educated, they tend to have links to the Western world being Christians, and therefore it's a little easier for them to migrate usually uh, in many cases. So for all of these reasons, uh, the, the Christians have been migrating, at, leaving at a faster rate than others, uh, and it is, a, it is a, one of the great uh, uh, challenges, I think, that we have. Uh, and it's not only uh, the Christians, it's the polarization of society. If you look at Iraq, if you look at Lebanon, if you look at um, uh, Syria now, uh, almost any country, there's a polarization going on. The minorities are being pulled in different directions. Con- societies that were very mixed are now less mixed, and you have Shiites and Sunnis and Kurds and Armenians and Druze and Maronites and Greek Orthodox and you, everybody now talks about the Middle East as all these minority groups and, and I never remember talking about I never heard of Sunnis and Shiites until 20 years ago I mean I heard of them but I never heard of them as political antagonists and people who were doing ethnic cleansing and bombing each other's uh, mosques and and the and the religious tensions that crop up in Egypt now and then these are modern political phenomena. Uh, the traditional Arab world, all of you who are from the Arab world know that um, uh, in Egypt there's 80 million people and, and 80 million people get up almost every day and have done so for the last 
1400 and whatever, 20, 30 years of Islamic life and Christians and Muslims get along together fine at the community level. Once in a while there's a political stress and they fight and people fight, but it's not just the Christians and the Muslims who are fighting, it's the Muslims and the Muslims and the government and the people and the police and the Muhabarat and, the, and everybody's fighting. And so I don't think we should isolate uh, the um, problem of Christians um, uh, more than, uh, more than uh, is necessary. But it is, it is a, a dramatic point, and the antidote to the dwindling number of Christians in the, in the Middle East, in the Arab world, uh, is a more democratic, a more prosperous, more stable Arab world. And I can assure you, if, it, if that happens, then the, if Christians would leave and other minorities would leave at a slower pace, and then many would start uh, coming back. How is the Kingdom of Jordan addressing the democratic yearning of its people? Well, like everything else Jordan does, it does it moderately and slowly and with a nice smile and with ahlan wa sahlan. And it's, a, it's, a, it's a wonderful country uh, with a very uh, uh, low intensity political system that changes very, very slowly. I think it's strange with the um, uprisings going on all over the Arab world. If you look at uh, Jordan, <coughs> Kuwait, uh, Morocco, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, UAE, Oman, the, the monarchies have the least stresses, the least uprising. Uh, there were some demonstrations in Jordan, there was a f- few little ones in Oman and some other things in Kuwait which are related to corruption and stuff. Uh, but the monarchies have a peculiar blend of uh, accountability and legitimacy, which is I say peculiar because it's a little bit unusual. Uh, the monarchies tend, because they're monarchies, they tend to be more sensitive to the, 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 the need to actually deliver uh, services to their people. Um, and they, they tend to be less intensely um, abusive police states like some of the so-called republics, so certainly like Egypt and Tunisia and Libya. Um, so I think the nature of change in the monarchies, Jordan being a great example, will be different than it is in the other countries. The, the demands on the regime were less intense than the demands on other, uh, other places. There wasn't a call to overthrow the regime. Um, um, the call was for constitutional reform and social justice and ending corruption. And the king understood that and responded uh, with equally low intensity responses. He set up a commission or two and they studied and they came up with recommendations. They're now making the ch- some changes limited. I think if that the, the importance is not that the changes were low intensity, but that they continue to happen. I think if you make some changes and the place doesn't go crazy and people realize that it's okay to make more constitutional changes, then there'll be others that will, will, will come along. But something very important happened a few days ago. The king named a new prime minister, and the new prime minister is a judge, a very respected judge, Aoun Khassani, who was on the International uh, Court of Justice um, in The Hague. Uh, So, you know, the symbolism of a judge replacing a general as prime minister is, I think, a very positive uh, sign. So we have to, again, be realistic and recognize that this change is going to happen at a slower pace in some of these countries, but the important thing is for the change uh, to, to keep happening. To what extent has the Obama administration contributed to the U.S.'s marginalization in the Middle East? It's contributed a little bit, but most of the main problems for the marginalization uh, happened before the Obama administration. Uh, But I think the Obama administration uh, just kind of confirmed a trend that was already there. The dramatic way in which Obama came out at the beginning of his administration uh, to uh, uh, open up to Iran to try to resolve the Arab-Israeli conflict and to hug every Muslim that he could find and, uh, you know, within the two-mile radius of him and to reach out to the Muslim world uh, was quite dramatic, I thought. It was very moving in a way, uh, but most of it failed. Most of it was either he gave up on it or he failed. So I give him an A for intent and a D- minus for achievement. He just wasn't able to actually achieve the good things he talked about, whether that's because he was um, subjected to pressures in Washington, pro-Israeli pressures or anti-Arab, anti-Muslim pressures that he couldn't overcome, or he just had incompetent people uh, working with him. Uh, They were amateurs in foreign affairs. I don't know the real 
answer, but I think he just contributed to the marginalization that uh, had already happened over the last uh, 30 years or so. Could the Iranian model revolution be in the process of being copied? Revolution taken over by religion? I don't think so, no. I don't think the Iranian revolution, uh, if you're talking about the revolution that overthrew the Shah, I don't see that at all as a, as a model. Um, the Iranian revolution in 1979, I think certainly was an inspiration at one level for pushing the Islamic movements that developed in the, uh, in the, seventh, in the 80s and the 90s. Uh, and the Islamic revolution came at a moment when the uh, Muslim brothers and other groups were already spreading throughout the Arab world. So um, the, the Islamicization of Iran and the Islamicization of Arab politics and protest politics happened together at the same time. The Islamic revolution in Iran has taken a course, had taken a turn, I think, uh, that has reduced its legitimacy and its attraction. I went to Iran last year, and I, I know it a bit, and I followed it very closely. Uh, I've never heard anybody in the Arab world tell me they want a, a political system like the Iranian one. I, nobody. But a lot of people admire Iran for challenging Israel and standing up to the U.S. and demanding its nuclear rights. So people admire the defiance of Iran but they don't want to copy its, uh, its democratic uh, system. This is like an endless, uh, yeah. a, a, bottomless, a bottomless pit. It's amazing. Yeah. In your view, what are the characteristics of the Middle East in the short term, given the change that the region is subjected to? I think in the short term we should expect a turbulent period, uh, progress forward and some uh, regression good news and bad news. Uh, uh, countries in the Arab world have lived for 50, 60 years under uh, non-democratic regimes with pretty bad economic management, uh, tensions that have brewed and brewed and brewed. For the, This is the third generation of, of people who are growing up in the Middle East without being free, without being able to express their identity, without being able to participate politically in society, to hold power accountable. Um, and that, that cumulative uh, resentment that has built up in three generations takes time to dissipate. It doesn't just disappear overnight. The second thing that I think you should uh, keep in mind is that uh, democratic transformations take a long time. They don't happen quickly. Um, the Soviet Union and the Soviet Empire was overthrown 20 years, 22 years ago. And if you look around the Soviet empire, the former Soviet countries, some of them are good democracies, some of them are medium, yani, okay democracies, and some of them are still police states, corrupt police states. So it, they've evolved in a way that uh, has progress and, and some aggression. And in this country, uh, the great uh, fountainhead of, of democratic and republican ideals for the world, uh, when this democracy started in the 1770s, the uh, democracy was for white men who owned land and who owned slaves, and nobody else had any rights in this country. Nobody existed in the eyes of the law. Uh, and it took you a civil war and uh, you know, 80, 90 years to stop slavery, and then it took you another 50 years to give women the vote, and then it took you another 40 years to give black people the vote. It took you a long time in this country, almost 180 years, to actually give all your citizens equal rights. So. These evolutions take a long time, so I think we should expect a bumpy road, uh, but as long as the general progress uh, is forward, then I think we should be, um, we should be uh, pleased with that. How do you suspect the Arab Spring will affect southern Arab states, specifically the UAE and Oman? I think in these small oil-rich countries, the uh, um, movement for change will be much slower. Uh, and I think the uh, uh, process of citizens expressing themselves will be different than in Egypt and Tunis and Syria. I think you're going to get... Now these, the social structure of these societies are very different. People don't go out on the street and demonstrate in, in Abu Dhabi and in, and in Oman. There was a few in Oman. But uh, they do it through the institutions of their tribal society and their monarchic systems. Uh, they, I think the the pressure building up in these societies, and it's very clear if you go there, I, I know these two countries well, the educated young people, uh, especially the young girls, they've created a whole parallel universe which is on their Blackberries and on their cell phones. And what they do is they've, they've created this incredible world 
where they communicate, where they express themselves, where they have fun. They do things that they're not allowed to do in public. So it's just a matter of time for that uh, private parallel world that they've created to, to keep pushing against the existing world and in political terms and social terms and uh, personal freedom terms. I don't think you're going to get uh, transitions to democratic republics, but I think you're going to get uh, systems where there'll be more freedoms, more options for people. Uh, they can express their identities a little bit more openly. And most importantly, they can contribute to the processes of public decision-making and develop forms of accountability. Uh, it's going to be much slower in those uh, societies. And one of the reasons is that they don't have any of, uh, most of them, with some exceptions, don't have any of the real pressures of poverty, of homelessness, uh, of despair that so many other people have in, uh, in the Arab world and places like Tunis and Egypt and Syria and Jordan where, where people have uh, really a hard time giving their kids enough calories to grow at a normal, uh, at a normal uh, height. I, uh, I pared down as you were talking. Uh, there were a lot of duplicate questions, and I think there are just a couple uh, that, that on issues that you haven't touched on. One concerns the situation in Syria and the possibility of outside influence, and this, the last one was on the, the role of Hezbollah in the Hariri assassination. What is the risk of civil war in Syria and the consequences for possible... Alawite, Sunnis, and Christians, and the consequences for Alawite, Sunnis, and Christians. I think the risk of civil war is small, but it's there. Um, most Arab countries have real tensions uh, between their different uh, ethnic and sectarian and tribal and national groups uh, because they've never been allowed to develop a normal way to relate to each other in a political system that's open and democratic. And in many of these countries, the regimes and foreigners both have manipulated the uh, minorities and the different groups. So if you look at um, how the um, Israelis, for instance, tried to deal with uh, uh, the Christians in Lebanon and people deal with the Druze and other people, and in Iraq, how the different external parties deal with different groups. And so there's been an attempt by uh, the regimes in these countries and the uh, external actors who penetrate, uh, who uh, interfere in the Arab countries, uh, to go against the desire of the citizens to have a country in which they're all equal citizens, which is what people are trying to do now. And they instead, people have tried to accentuate the differences and the uh, ethnic identities and religious identities. And therefore, it's not accident that there's uh, tension. And some of these things, you're seeing them... Um, in Syria, and my personal guess, I go to Syria regularly and I've spoken to people in the regime and people in the opposition, so I, I have a reasonably good view of it. I've gone there for years and years. My guess is that there won't be a civil war. Uh, I think there will be, as you're starting to see now, sectarian assassinations, and these will be partly deliberate attempts to stir up a civil war. If you look across the region, I mentioned that there was two constants in every Arab country, uh, the demand for social justice and the demand for constitutional reform. But there's a third constant in every single country. The regimes in every country that have faced uh, re rebellions or, or demonstrations have said this is the hand of foreigners who are here trying to manipulate our people and cause trouble. Um, I don't think that's true myself, um, but, I th but this is, it's interesting that the regimes would keep uh, saying this, and, and the regime saying there's going to be sectarian war and we're not going to let it happen, whereas the reality is that regimes in the Arab countries probably at some point use this boogeyman of sectarian warfare to scare their, their own people to say, well, we should keep things as they are because only my regime can keep things stable and peaceful, uh, which I think is a fallacy. It's wrong, and, and most of the people who are demonstrating know that. So I don't expect civil war, uh, but I think low-intensity tension, as we're seeing some assassinations, and, um, and everything that the uh, demonstrators have done in these countries has been the exact opposite of sectarian war or civil war, uh, that the people on the streets are all working together uh, wherever they can, uh, and uh, in mixed communities, you find, you find that the opposition groups are actually working very closely together. 
How accurate is the news we are hearing about Syria and what influence, if any, is Iran, Saudi Arabia having in the uprising against Assad? Um, the, the uprising is a very serious one. Um, the, it's a national uprising. Uh, I would say about half the people of Syria at least are actively uh, supporting the uprising, maybe more. And a lot of people in Syria support the president and the regime. Uh, and, then, and quite a few people are kind of just watching to see what happens. But it's, really, it's a real national uprising. It's not just a few people here and there. It could have been contained uh, in March and April, but the response of the regime was very uh, inadequate. Uh, they, they didn't take the opportunity to actually start the process of political reform, because in the beginning, the demands were for uh, islah, for reform. There, there wasn't a demand to get rid of the regime in, the, in March and April and May. That started to happen um, after, uh, after the killings of uh, uh, Dera'a and other places, and especially the torture of uh, the young boy, uh, uh, Hamz al-Khatib, I think his name was. Um, and so but by May, uh, it became probably too late to really solve this through a reform process because there was too much anger, too much blood, um, and the regime really missed the opportunity. Now, external factors are almost certainly there because they are in every Arab country. The Iranians and the Saudis are involved in a big regional Cold War. They use their influence, money, arms, uh, stirring up media stuff, uh, and the Iranians are very close uh, supporters of the Syrian government and, and the Saudis probably now are, are supporting people against the Syrian government. We never know with the Saudis because they don't advertise what they're doing, but it's, they pulled their ambassador from Syria. They've spoken against the regime's uh, policies. So I think the uh, situation in Syria is uh, like the situation in Yemen, is one in which you have a strong government that's determined to use its force to stay in power you have a strong opposition that's determined to keep demonstrating to challenge the government. They're pretty evenly matched. There's not going to be any significant external intervention. And I think the big next thing to look for in Syria is the uh, opposition groups having started to unify into a single uh, national council uh, to look for them to come up with new mechanisms to challenge the government. The big weakness in Syria for everybody is the economy. And I think the economy is going to be the Achilles heel. Uh, the government has enough money to make it through the next five, six months or so, but it's, uh, by the late winter, if there isn't a radical change, the government is gonna start running out of money. And uh, so the economy is one weakness. And then uh, if any of the basic pillars of the regime start to fall, which I would say are the Alawites, the security services, uh, and the big merchant families of Aleppo and Damascus. If one of those three pillars of the regime uh, cracks and starts to pull away, then the whole edifice will come down. Uh, right now, they haven't cracked, and there's a pretty coherent uh, system among the leadership. And there are a lot of Syrians who support the government. It's not the, Syria is not a handful of uh, thugs with uh, 20 million good guys. Uh, there's, a lot, there's millions and millions of people who support the government for various... Uh, uh, reasons. Uh, so I think it's going to go on for a while um, until uh, one of the um, pillars of the regime either cracks or if the regime succeeds in uh, finally crushing the opposition either by killing uh, many of them or um, uh, making it impossible for them to continue demonstrating day after day after day. Um, we'll see. Uh, it's very hard to, to predict. But the regime, I believe, is in deep trouble because the three key circles of its legitimacy have all been shaken. Its internal support, all the regional powers have spoken out against it. Even the Iranians have spoken out saying that Assad should find some political uh, process of change. Uh, and internationally, there's strong pressure. So the, the internal, the regional, and the global are all three simultaneously pressing on the regime, and it's very difficult to sustain uh, incumbency in that kind of situation. What is your opinion of the role of Hezbollah in the killing of Hariri, and has this issue, and how will this issue develop in Lebanon? Um, I personally can't imagine that Hezbollah as a movement has anything to do with the killing of Hariri. It's just beyond comprehension. Uh, 
we have had an uh, extensive ex investigation for the last four and a half years or so, five years, by this international tribunal, very, very uh, technologically uh, sophisticated, extremely uh, thorough investigation, checking most of the significantly credible leads. And the evidence has finally been produced, part of it in the indictment, and four people were indicted who are people who are members of or associated with Hezbollah. The indictment doesn't name Hezbollah as, as the accused party. It names these four individuals. Uh, the evidence is uh, fascinating, intriguing, but not clear if it's compelling in a, rule of, in a court of law. It's mostly circumstantial evidence. Uh, the indictment has been published. You can all read it on the website. Go to the Special Tribunal for Lebanon and website, and it's there. It's very interesting reading. Um, the court will now hold the uh, cases, hold the trials for these four people in absentia because the Lebanese government, uh, not surprisingly, wasn't able to find these four guys to bring them to The Hague. And, and, uh, and so the court decided just three days ago that, we will, that it'll hold the trials in absentia. And this is really important, to let the process of, of law run its course. Uh, this is a political process and it's a judicial process at the same time. I, I support the, the tribunal. Uh, I have no idea who killed Hariri. There's four or five people who could be named as possible culprits. Um, and I, don't know, I have no idea who killed him. Um, but it's very important to let this process play itself out. Let's see the evidence in court. Let's see the arguments of the prosecution. Uh, let's hear any defense that is presented. Um, and then I think we can have a better basis uh, to decide. But I don't think uh, Hezbollah uh, was involved in this process. Um, the problem for Hezbollah is that it is uh, caught in a very difficult situation politically uh, because of two things, because of the potential changes in Syria, which will cause it great uh, logistical problems, because Syria is very important for Hezbollah as an ally and uh, a place for movement of uh, supplies and things and training and whatever and, and a conduit to Iran and uh, for many other reasons. And, um, uh, and also Hezbollah is facing internally in Lebanon uh, strong criticism. Uh, people in Lebanon today openly criticize Hezbollah. They make fun of it. They ridicule it sometimes. Um, and this is un un unprecedented. You know, five, ten years ago Hezbollah was was, was you know, almost worshipped as a great heroic group that liberated the South. Uh, and among Shiites, it's widely respected because they picked up this community of Shiites who were third-class citizens in Lebanon in the 50s and 60s and picked them up and made them strong and respected and powerful and part of the government and, and widely admired around the whole Middle East. So Hezbollah has great uh, credibility and legitimacy among its own supporters and for Many other Lebanese for liberating the South, people have a lot of respect for Hezbollah. But Hezbollah has the problem that for many Lebanese who are critical of it, all it offers them is perpetual warfare. And they don't want to be in perpetual warfare. They don't want to have their country destroyed every six years by Israeli bombardment supported by American politicians and British politicians. They don't, they don't want perpetual warfare. And and they want to celebrate the resistance and the liberation of the South. Uh, so this is Hezbollah's dilemma. How does it make a transition, maintaining its role as a resistance, uh, but also being more deeply integrated into the Lebanese system? It's in the cabinet, it's in the parliament, it's already in the, in the system, but it also insists on staying outside the system with its military capabilities. And it's seen by many Lebanese as a proxy for Iran. Uh, they see Hezbollah as a puppet of Iran, which I don't think it is. It's a close ally of Iran, and it's structurally linked to Iran. So it's, there's a great dilemma that uh, Hezbollah has to deal with, and uh, it's, not an easy, uh, it's not an easy one. And this court case will um, probably not have huge uh, influence on it, because Hezbollah, for the last couple of years, has been pretty steadily discrediting the court with various arguments and evidence, which is medi medium uh, credible, not all of it is credible, but they've raised enough doubts about the court uh, to have a lot of people now not particularly interested in seeing what the court does. 
uh, the, uh, whatever it does, people don't particularly care. Uh, other people care very much. Um, and uh, so I think we have to see what the court does, and then we'll have more evidence, and then it's really now in the court of public opinion, and people will uh, judge the evidence and, and judge uh, for themselves. So thank you again very much. Very much. You've been listening to journalist, scholar, and newspaper editor Rami G. Khoury speaking at the Westminster Presbyterian Church in Portland, Oregon. The title of his lecture is Diplomatic Stalemate and Democratic Revolts, Making Sense of a Middle East Transition. To find out more about Rami Khoury and his work, please visit his website at ramikhoury.com. This program was sponsored by the Institute for Christian Muslim Understanding. To find out more about that organization, please visit their website at icmuoregon.org. This program was produced by PDX Justice Media Productions of Portland, Oregon. To find out more about our work and to access our growing library of free, on-demand streaming video and audio programs, please visit our website at pdxjustice.org and write to us with your questions and comments at pdxjustice at riseup.net. We'd love to hear from you. Many of our programs are available on DVD and Blu-ray video disc. Please write to us for ordering information. Thanks for tuning in, and thanks for supporting listener-sponsored radio, public access cable television, net neutrality, independent bookstores, and all forms of grassroots democratic community media.